What's going on, guys and gals? Bonafide Hustler here with another Q&A, an open Q&A regarding shoes, bikes, and bags, and high-ticket items selling on eBay and also selling locally. So that's Hustler, what's yeah. going on uh, today. Let me make sure I mute this other feed. And it's going to be an open Q&A. So, uh, you know, kind of if you got questions or anything like that, or if you need clarifications on something, then uh, let me know. Man, of course, as soon as I start the show, a call will come in and uh, hold on real quick. Let me just make sure I let this person know that I got a call going on. All right, hold on. Okay, so that's basically what the show is going to be all about. Anyways, let me, I got back to that. And um, we're going to be talking about uh, specifically the, the bag hustle, the bike hustle, um, also the high ticket item hustle and um, the shoe hustle. So all things that I am still currently doing. And uh, when we talk about the hustle, we're talking about eBay, we're talking about Craigslist, Facebook Marketplace, how to move the items from point A, point a to point B. Think about questions regarding the uh, process of you know making a decision to buy the products in the first place, things like that. So um, let me know. I got so many things going on in the background on this computer. It's insane. We got videos uploading after this thing is going live. Uh, more importantly, I do want to give you guys a heads up that all of my guides, all right, all of my guides are 20% off until Friday. There's only one set of links in the description right now of this video. You can go check that out. But I basically want to do this video for you guys that are having questions or maybe are on the fence of possibly buying a guide or two or all. You know, I want to basically clarify things for you guys if you have, you know, questions or anything like that. And of course, if you're in the feed right now and you're watching and you have one of the guides, um, I'll be asking periodically through the show, which one is the best one to buy? Because I had that question come down today on Instagram, which is like, which one is the best one to get? If I had you know enough money to buy one guide, like which one should I get? And I didn't really want to answer that for that person, but I think it's really important that the public, maybe you guys that are have bought or you guys that have bought the actual guides, some of you um, to answer that question. Which one made you the most money? Which one were you most impressed with? Which one did you echo with the most? So let's get some questions going on right now. Let me shout out a couple people on the feed and we'll get right to the Q&A. All right, we have Joe Melijo, we have Ernesto, we have Mary in the feed, Arkham Vintage, we have Joe, what's up Joe? Uh, Clint, we have Mary again, Chad, a bunch of people in here, Harry Tornado, what's up? Good to see everyone. Okay, so here's the first question from Joe Molina. What Sony camera do you shoot all your products with? I shoot with a Sony NEXF3. It's actually not a very current day camera. Um, it's something that I bought, I think, maybe five or six years ago. I think you can score one for about 200 bucks on eBay. I like it a lot. It has interchangeable lens capability, so it's not just a normal point and shoot, but actually you can take the lens off, put a different lens. It's a really good camera. Um, it does not have a flip up screen does it or not i think it does flip up it's a semi okay it does flip up the screen does flip up uh you can get a, a a different kind of microphone for it if you want to go vlogging with it but in its original setup it's a pretty decent vlogging camera already um you can score for pretty cheap especially if you go to pawn shops or something like that you should be able to get it for less than 200 dollars sony nex f3 it shoots pictures really fast i'm very quick with the manual zoom and everything like that I've been using that camera forever. It's super awesome. A good thing about that camera is that um, other Sony cameras, even present day, like my A6500, which is sitting right here, um, this is a really, really good camera. So this is a really good vlogging camera with a Rode shotgun mic on it. This is an A6500. They have A6000s, A6300, A6500, and of course the one that everyone now buys as a YouTuber, like an A7 three or something like that that's like a two thousand dollar camera this whole rig with everything on it is probably like 1500 bucks um and this camera is really good for everything um but i don't really like it for pictures or anything like that just because the nex f3 is a lot better and a faster and more simpler camera to work with and the autofocus is super good um but that just gives you an example of like a very basic camera to a very advanced grade camera and there's even more advanced than that. I have one sitting on the shelf over here, which well, it's, in the, it's in the gym, but um, it's more of a, uh, a like a not a vlogging camera, but like an actual production can record, you know, over 30 minutes at a time kind of camera. So you don't need the latest and greatest. And if you just want to start out with eBay or start out with Facebook Marketplace or Craigslist, really a cell phone is all you need. But if you want to step up your game and get a better sensor altogether and get better pictures, you know, that can you know, basically sensors that can 
you know, bring in more light so you can get a better picture, then you're going to want something like a point and shoot um, or something such as a point and shoot with interchangeable lenses. So real important. Sony NEX F3 is a really good one. Okay. Uh, weather sucks today. Yes, it does. Arkham Vintage, that's right. In Texas, it's terrible right now. We have hi from Yuma. I think that's Arizona. That's Alaska. What's up? It's raining in Dallas. It's raining here in Austin. Um, okay, so sell quick, ship quick. Do you use a mic when filming your videos? Oh, I'd like to keep most of these questions to uh, uh, bikes, shoes, bags, and high-ticket items, but I'll answer this question for you. Sell, ship, uh, sell quick, ship quick, since I am a vlogger, YouTuber, and I have this channel. Um, do I use a mic when filming your videos? So the camera that I use to film my videos is not here right now. It's actually in the other room. It's a really simple $550, maybe $600 camera. So I say simple because it is a point and shoot without interchangeable lens. Uh, flip screen and everything like that. We use that because we can whip it around real fast. We can put it in a pocket real fast. It can be remain. It can be semi covert, you know, stealthy. Uh, it's called a Canon G7X Mark II. That's what we use for the Saturday vlogs, and uh, most of the Saturday vlogs are filmed with that camera. Um, if I'm going to do a hot shot, which is during the week kind of vlogs, where it's just me holding the camera and I um, don't want many things in my pocket, then I will use another camera which is sitting here, um, and this is a very basic camera that you can get for about 40 to maybe 100 bucks on a, at a pawn shop or maybe on eBay. This is called a PowerShot Elf 110 HS made by Canon, all right? It's a very staple camera with vloggers probably three to five years ago. Now most vloggers go with Sony RX100 or something like that or the Canon G7X Mark II. But this is still a really good camera. Look how flat this thing is. This is insane, right? This is my cell phone right here, and this is this camera. You can kind of just see, you know, when it comes down to concealing it. I mean, like people in the thrift stores have no idea what's going on when, you, when you're vlogging with this. But no flip screen or anything like that, but pretty good image. Um, I wouldn't shoot eBay stuff with this or anything like that. I think a cell phone camera is better. Uh, but if you just want to get a cool vlogging camera that's pretty quick and you can just flip it around like this and you kind of know that you're in frame, this is a really good one to get. This is the ELF 110 HS. There's other models, like a 320 HS or something like that. I suggest you get the one with the push button record on the back, not the touch screen one, okay? Very, very important to have a push button record because touch screen stuff gets really annoying. All right, let's go to some more questions here regarding shoes, bags, bikes, high ticket items. Um, I really wanna clarify any questions you guys have or if you're on the fence of buying one of the guides that is on sale this week. Really important if you're wondering, who wow, you know, like I've always wanted to pick up one of the guides. Now's the time to do it. I have never run a sale and blanketed all my products ever. So the sale goes until Friday. And uh, if you're ever on the fence of buying one of the products, I think now is the best time to do it. But if you have any questions about that kind of stuff, then please put it in the feed. And I'll try to help you as much as I can today. Um, shell sh <laughs> sell quick, ship quick says, reselling question. I have a women's bike. It's Kitanti 44. Would you know how much that goes for? or where I can find the value I can't find souls. Okay, so first of all, if you're trying to find souls on a Scatante 44, a Scatante is, it's a road bike company. A lot of the same frame, okay, so Scatante's frames are built in the same factory as Fuji frames. And Fuji is not the greatest in the world, but for a budget bike or a budget road bike or a budget mountain bike, it's not bad, you know? Um, we own a Fuji, I own a Scatante, freaking awesome bike. I can, you know, outrace, Plenty of people with a Scatante, honestly. Um, I have a Scatante Team Edition road bike, which cost a pretty penny back in the day. It's a very fast bike. It's extremely light. Almost every component on the bike was carbon. Um, but this is question is, a, is about a women's bike, a Scatante 44. And I wanted to clarify Scatante because sometimes people are like, I've never heard of it, so it must suck. You know, it's totally, totally untrue. It's a good company, and a lot of times with, when it comes to – road bike brands and stuff like that, you're just paying for the brand. Like, you know, Scatante is basically like entry level carbon, but super good and not stamped with some high grade brand that like makes it a premium of a thousand bucks for no freaking reason, you know? Um, but if you can't find the soles on an eBay market, it's because you're trying to look on eBay or bicyclebluebook.com, which is a terrible place to find any resale. If you live in a bike friendly town, then you have to discount Scatante from a top brand like uh, even like Giant or Trek or Specialized because not many people know about it. 
So you kind of have to go, that takes a penalty hit just like that. Um, but I would say if it has gears, if it's aluminum with a carbon fork, you're probably going to want to ask in the vicinity of maybe 300 to 600 in any given town in America. If it's a full carbon bike, um, and I think you say Scatante 44, meaning 44 centimeters, which translates to a small frame road bike, then that's going to probably, if you have a carbon fiber Scatante road bike, now you're talking closer to maybe 600 to a thousand dollars or something like that. But you take also a hit because it's a it's a small frame road bike, right? And now you have to find a shorter person to buy it, which means the buying pool is much, it's it's more condensed, it's tinier, you know. Um, but it's not a bad bike. Like I own a Scatante, it's freaking awesome. It's a great bike. Uh, you know, like I said, I can roast, I can, I can roast people with thousands of dollars better bikes. It, like the bike doesn't make the rider, the rider makes the bike. Uh, but it does pay to have all carbon. So all carbon as opposed to aluminum or steel is more preferable. It's lighter and it's uh, you know it it's more it has more damping on the road. It's just faster. Period. So um, so that's that. Uh, yeah, so you don't, you're not going to find the souls of that on an eBay market because like nobody moves Scatante bikes on eBay. Like nobody does. It's just sold locally. 99, well, about 95% of the bikes that I flip are done locally. So very, very important. Unless you have some like super awesome vintage BMX or super vintage road bike that's extremely collectible or, you know, something like a Schwinn Stingray from the seventies or something like that. There's very few bikes that really belong on eBay. Um, because you have to take the risk of shipping it as well, which means you have to insure it as well because it's a bigger box and things can start poking out of the boxes left and right. So you want to insure the thing. It's got to you know, be put in a box. It's got to be packed up, usually professionally. That already tacks on between $1 and $200 more than the bike's value. And these are the things that have to go on your head as you put a bike on eBay. You know, It has to be destined for eBay because there are other things that have to be considered, especially shipping and especially packing. Okay, um, uh, what's up, everyone? Good to see everyone. I don't know how many people are tuning in, so someone tell me that real quick. Um, once in a lifetime sale, people says Arkham Vintage. You know, maybe not once in a lifetime this sale, but this is something I've never done, so I don't. I can't say if I'm ever going to do it again. I might do one at the end of summer, but I'm not going to sit there and abuse a sale just because of a sale. Like I think it's really important to do it, maybe seasonal or very. You know, something like that. I don't know. Like, I've never done it before. So, you know, if you want to pick up a good, you know, price on a guide, I think now's the time, basically. Um, Blake, why do I never pick up Jordans? Um, first of all, Jordans aren't super readily available here in Austin, Texas. Um, I think it'd be more readily available in places like Houston, um, places where the sneaker game is just bigger. Here in Austin, like, the game is different. It's a lot of hipsters and uh, you know, like flannel and like boots and breweries and stuff like that. It's not the, exactly the typical place where you see Jordans sold or, you know, LeBrons or anything like that. Um, and that's not to say that the sneakerheads don't reside here in Austin, Texas. It's just not a as popular here as like a Miami or Atlanta or Charlotte or um, Houston, Dallas, San Antonio. Like the shoe game isn't as important here. It doesn't mean it's not important it's just it's not as important that said when you deal with jordans and things like that in the thrift store there are fakes out there right and i'm not a super jordan expert um or anything like that and just because it says jordan doesn't necessarily mean it's profitable you have to find still the profitable jordans within the jordan niche and you have to whittle away the fakes so there's a lot of things that can go wrong especially if you're a beginner and that's the reason why i don't talk about that kind of stuff in shoes to bucks because to convey all that information to an absolute beginner that might pick up that guide you know i'm sitting there looking at for i'm looking out for their best best interest and their best interest is to make some money based upon the guide not to get suspended on ebay not to uh you know think they found gold and all of a sudden they're like wow like now i'm suspended on ebay this bona fide hustler guy and his guides suck real bad like i don't want that that's not my best interest and so that's the reason why i didn't write about that kind of stuff in the guides um it, it's it's touchy it's the same thing with, when you look at bags to bucks you don't see prada bags in there chanel or dooney or anything crazy like that that could have a high amount of counterfeits um because i'm not an expert at that kind of stuff and the counterfeits can get really good sometimes um to the point where you know sometimes the counterfeits are too good they're way too good sometimes even the places that verify counterfeits can get tricked you have to be real careful so 
I don't like to preach about that kind of stuff. Um, I'd rather stay away from it. And that's the main reason why I stay away from Jordans, on top of the fact that Jordans aren't really popular in this town in the first place. I just kind of stay away from them unless it's something that I'm absolutely certain that uh, I know it's real. Like the last pair that I, I flipped that was like, oh my God, like it was absolutely certain. I think it was like called Raptors or Aqua. I don't know. But one of those I found that, you know, and, and they went pretty, pretty quick and I was able to verify them pretty quickly. But I'm not an expert at that. So I don't want to claim to be one. And I certainly don't want to write a guide on something that I'm not an expert on it whatsoever. Um, uh, okay, so it's a girl 78. What do you do with your unsold merchandise? Um, you know, unsold merchandise is still, it should be listed. Like if you have anything that's unsold that's not listed, that's not good. You shouldn't be going to the thrift stores if you have stuff that potentially has good resale value in it and it's just sitting in your house somewhere. So that's rule number one. What do I do with unsold merchandise? If I get tired of it, or let's say that I find a flaw in it later somehow, um, then I would um, definitely consider donating it because that's important. You can get some donation slips based on that. Uh, they don't, they don't, the donation slips here are good for tax season, but you also get a coupon at Savers when you bring donations. So that's to be considered as well. Uh, even though if you don't might, if, even if you might think that the item has no value, the fact that you get a 20% savers coupon at least here in Austin, Texas, you know, if I apply that to a $50 purchase, for example, I'm, that item that I donated already kind of made me 10 bucks, you know. So I'm looking at it like I'm looking at it like that. Um, yeah. Um, what other kind of questions do we have here? What's the best biking jerseys to sell? All right. So the best brands when it comes to biking jerseys. You're going to want to look at Castelli, Capo, Rafa, R-A-P-H-A. So Castelli, C-A-S-T-E-L-L-I. It has a scorpion for a logo. Rafa has nothing for a logo. It's just like, it's just Rafa and really cool letters, R-A-P-H-A. Capo sometimes goes with a C for the logo, but Capo, C-A-P-O. Um, and then another one, let's think if we can get another one in there. What would it be? Some primal wears are pretty good. Primal wear jerseys, some of those are pretty good um yeah i'm trying to think of one more there is one more that like kind of eludes me right now uh some giordana as well g i o g o yeah g i o r d a n a that one's pretty good and certain pearl izumi things are good as well pearl izumi um but more or less the shorts when it comes to pearl izumi um okay um, okay, so here's a clarif clarification question. Like, what do you do about eBay items that haven't sold? Well, I keep them in eBay. That's obvious. But if they haven't sold in a very long time, I'll usually donate them just to, like, make sure my store doesn't have a bunch of fluff in it. I don't like fluff in my store whatsoever. Even though at this point, as many items as I have for sale, I don't have thousands of items for sale, which is good. But, uh, you know, if I have 10 fluff items, I'll take the 10 out and I'll donate them. Like, I don't really care. Um, yeah, I have a $60 a month store option as well so that should be considered um i mean i could put a whole lot more items in there even if they're fluff and i could still relist them or not, i could still gtc them every single month and i wouldn't be penalized in any way I'm trying to think and there's some new rules with ebay and everything like that everything right now and i kind of like it is good till canceled so um i like that i, I really do I mean, it's less work for me to mess with but i have a feeling that now items are there's a higher chance for items to get stale. And so I think I'm gonna have to tweak certain things around. For another video, I'll discuss with you guys like what my eBay strategy is this year with the amount of time that I can put into the project. Uh, that's for a whole nother video. I think you're gonna wanna tune into it though because uh, you're probably gonna want to emulate some of it. Um, okay, Teresa Corder, I found a very vintage looking heavy canvas with leather strap Siemens bag with a long S. Is that worth anything? I can't find anything like it. Look, so canvas, heavy gray canvas with good leather. If it's not a strong brand like uh, White Wing, White Wing's okay. What's another one? Frost River, uh, CC Filson, uh, Orvis Battenkill. Uh, what's another one that's really good as well? I mean, there's so many. Well, I wouldn't say there's so many. There's probably like five really good ones. Outside of that, you know, you can still get high grade canvas with some decent leather on there and you can put some embroidery and it can be a private label product. But the problem is a strong brand's not writing on it. So brands 
in some cases make or break the deal. When it comes to canvas and leather bags, it absolutely makes the deal. So I can't tell you if it's really worth anything. I would say that, you know, if you're dead, look at the zippers. The zippers a lot of times tell the whole story. If you got some really thick YKK zippers, that's amazing. Or some talon zippers or something like that. The zippers are going to tell everything. If you have these like little tiny micro crappy zippers, then you, that shouldn't be on a bag that's like heavy duty canvas with, you know, big leather handles or anything like that. You should have a nice burly zipper. And that's where some people cheap out on those burly looking brands, I mean, burly looking bags, but like crappy brands. They'll, you have these little crappy zippers on these really amazing bags. And that's how you know it's like usually not even worth messing with. Um, how can I? How can someone tell if a Rock Shocks or Cannondale Single Shocks are still in good condition? So it's pretty simple. All you have to do is back off the dust boot and compress it yourself. If you see oil shooting out, or if you see oil residue of some sort, then it could be blown. Not blown, but basically the oil is going past the seal, which is not good. The wiper seal. Um, so if it goes up and down, that's pretty good. Some of these shocks are spring or air inside they have like an actual coil spring inside which need no maintenance and some of them are air they have air uh basically you have to inflate them with a, an air pump not a bicycle tire pump but an actual shock pump um and but the main yeah but the main thing if it compresses up and down that's a really good sign already um if it has nasty oily residue on the stanchions which if you back up the door the dust seals and you look at the stanchions if you see some nasty residue there wipe it off and then compress it about 10 times if you still see some more oil going through then you could just say that the fork needs to be rebuilt you don't have to rebuild it or pay to get it rebuilt or anything like that just say fork may need rebuild you could say something like that because it may or may not i mean it depends some people don't care about that kind of stuff and they'd rather you know blow it all to hell and then like rebuild the whole thing or some people you know just know how to do it themselves. So, you know, don't sit there and go, um, don't sit there and get it rebuilt because sometimes a person might know how to do it themselves and save themselves like 60 bucks because a rebuild on a fork front or back is usually like a hundred bucks. Um, Joe Molina, all I have to say is buy the guides. If you're here, you already know the Bonafide Hustler drops mad knowledge, support his efforts and all the free info he gives. Hey, thank you, Joe. That's awesome. Um, NASCAR man, 3345. I have a Gary Fisher A3000 Kyber carbon fiber frame with the rock shot judy front fork what should i sell it for um an a3000 let me proof this but usually when it has a rock shock judy that kind of sticks the bike into an early 2000s model or a late 90s model because a judy is a fork judy is a rock shock fork that is not made anymore um or maybe it is made anymore but like i've never seen a bike with it anymore so a3000 gt is that what it is i think you said a gt i'm gonna look it up for like one second real quick here uh it's gary fisher sorry okay so gary fisher i have a feeling i kind of know what this is going to look like um it's just the one with the weird suspension that's like let's take a look an a3000 gary fisher um oh okay i think that's an area that's weird it's coming up with a gary fisher hi-fi but it's not a hi-fi what you have make sure you let me know what that thing is a gary fisher a3000 carbon fiber frame with a rock shock if it has a rock shock to judy Gary Fisher isn't the, strong, the strongest brand either. That's the problem with Gary Fisher. They had some really strong brand bikes about 10 years ago. Um, typically, they were like the hardtail ones like the, or a road bike like a Cronus or something like that. Um, but a Gary Fisher with a Rock Shock Judy fork, anything with a Rock Shock Judy typically is in the vicinity of probably four to 600 bucks. It more than likely has 26 inch wheels, which now to this day standards are kind of outdated wheel, wheel sizes. So... I would comfortably say, with even without looking at the picture, that this is probably a four hundred to a six hundred dollar bike, more than likely. Um, okay, <laughs> what do we got here? Fifty three people live, probably more by now. Hopefully, let me go to. I'm going to try to get all the the questions asked here. Uh, no shaving deals while thrifting. No, no shaving deals whatsoever. Um, how do you list multiple pairs of the same shoe? Separate listings or bundle or whatever. If you have multiple pairs of the exact same shoe you can just increase the quantity that's assuming that you have the the actual um like actual same size um since i do mostly use things or slightly use or even mint pairs of shoes um i'll put one for every single one um if i find two by any chance of the same thing 
um, then if they're in exactly the same condition, I could put quantity two in there in eBay. And that way, when one listing sells, your listing doesn't go away completely. Like there's still one more left. It knows that, you know, um, the last time I did multiple listings or listings with quantities that were higher were things that were, I found on like clearance aisles of maybe uh, target or something like that, that was destined for eBay because I was gated in Amazon. Um, so you can think of things like maybe, is it used Logitech things or just random things, right? And, um, you know, you find five of the same item and you can't sell it on Amazon, but it's still a good deal. You proof it with eBay and there's still, let's say, 40 bucks to be made on each and every one. So as long as the, you know, the boxes look pretty decent and everything like that, and they're universally looking okay, then you can put that as a listing in eBay quantity four. And then um, as they sell, it just tells you which one, which person has shipped it off to, but your listing goes from, you know, four to three, three to two, and that's how it works. Um, okay, so yeah, but if you list multiple pairs of the same shoe, as long as they're the same exact size, you can do that kind of thing. Um, there's a way in eBay too, where you can put different sizes in there as well, but I don't mess with that. Um, cause yeah, like I said, I do the mostly used shoes. Um, um, here we go. Okay. So sub bonafide this is from hustle, man. Would you sell Harley boots on eBay or your booth? Okay. So just because this is Harley Davidson doesn't mean it's Harley actual like boots because other companies are licensed with Harley to make stuff. And there's some bad Harley boots out there, just like there's some bad Harley Davidson jackets out there that are just junky Harley Davidson shirts, long sleeves. There's some things with like sequins and like weird things on it, you know? So it's hard to say because some hard, I would say 20% of all the Harley boots that I do see in the thrift stores would be destined for eBay. Most of the other ones are destined for just a local sell. Um, I could put them in my booth if I want to, but typically, First resort would be eBay. If it's if it's an actual Harley Davidson boot, I would go to eBay with that. But if it's like some knockoff but still good quality, I would go to local markets because the last resort would be my antique booth. I can't remember the last time my booth actually moved Harley boots because they just don't go there. Um, strength brand jump trainers are they fast movers? I would say relatively, yeah. They're going to get a lot of like questions and stuff, and you're going to get a lot of offers, but strength brand jump trainers in a good size should sell and if you get them for a good price um should sell within one or two months uh arkham vintage great question do you ever have a garage sales to sell to sell dead inventory typically no but when if i do have a garage sale it's once every two years and if i have anything that's kind of dead then i'm like all right before i donate this stuff i can want to give it a fair chance to sell for maybe what i paid for it or a little bit more then yeah, I'll put it in the garage sale, of course. Um, Idaho Thrifter, are Hondo Cowboy boots a good flip? They're okay. They're not the greatest thing ever. Um, I would put it down there with, uh, gosh, what other kind of boots would be down there in that category? It's just there's so many other boots made, um, not to mention like a bazillion made in Mexico ones that are really not worth anything. But I would say from the cream of the crop down to the bottom, I mean, the cream of the crop is probably going to be um, Heritage, Lucchese. Um, what else is cream of the crop out there? Um, I just got a pair like last weekend. What do they call it? Old Gringo is really good too. Um, and then from there, you know, I would go Tony Lama, Justin, Oh, actually, Larry Mahans, then Tony Lama, then Justin, and then kind of any other boot below that just kind of goes because there's a bunch of other ones under there. And I would put Hondo under those other ones. Um, <laughs> Brooklyn State of Mind, how much do I sell via FBA? Not very much. Like, I have another FBA shipment going out probably, like, in a couple days. It's mostly guitars with games attached to them, um, just other random stuff. So, you know, an FBA shipment for me might be once every two to three weeks. It just depends, you know. Um, what else we got here? Um, okay, how much do I sell bike jerseys for? Even some with company logos and events. Okay, so that last part, even some with company logos or events, I really don't like to, to mess with those. Or anything that has like so-and-so chiropractor or any kind of supporter, sorry, any kind of sponsors for a certain race. I don't like buying those kind of jerseys. The jerseys that have the most resale to them are retro jerseys with really cool brands plus 
the actual components that were on that brand's bikes. So for instance, um, I'm trying to think of one that's really good. You can get one that says like uh, Dean, for example, which is a titanium road bike or a mountain bike manufacturer, or even Moots, for example. And then you might see like a Moots jersey or a Dean jersey with like RockShox logo on it, um, Hutchison tires from back in the day that were on these bikes, um, just other random stuff, but it's never going to have like you know, Westlake Hills chiropractor person on there and uh, something, something beauty salon and something, something running shop. So you're not going to see those. Like you're going to see just the components of the bike. And you want to be looking at that retro colors, of course, are the first indicator of a retro jersey more than anything. Um, but when you're dealing with bike jerseys, yeah, you want to deal with strong brands first. And then right out of that would be strong brands plus strong components, make a good jersey. And then I would not touch anything under that for the most part whether it be some weird ride or some weird 10k or century ride or something like that like i wouldn't touch it because those are the ones with all the sponsors on them and things that don't matter like no one looks for those kind of things like people want to ride a good bike brand and they want to rep it like but they don't want this other random yahoo stuff on there either so that's kind of the buying mentality of that plus anything really tour de france ish um, is going to sell pretty well. Like those kind of jerseys or rider type jerseys that are Tour de France um, for the past, let's say, comfortably five years or so, those are going to sell pretty well. Um, and none of those jerseys are going to have any chiropractor things on them or beauty salons or, you know, so and so car dealership sponsorships. No, none of those are going to have those on there. Now, they might have car logos on them like Audi or Saab or things that were part of the riding crew that rode behind the riders to like a support crew, you know, the ones that carry the extra wheels and the extra bikes for the riders, like those might be on the jerseys and that's okay. Um, but you don't want anything local business related on those jerseys. Um, Joe Molina, what was my favorite guide to make? That's a really, really good question. Um, but I can tell you right now that bags to bucks out of all of them, surprisingly did the best. Um, but I also launched Shoes to Bucks like five months later. So it's hard to say like, at this point, like Bags to Bucks has a five month advantage, you know, on Shoes to Bucks. They're close, but Bags to Bucks has sold more. I personally think Shoes to Bucks is better because everywhere you go are shoes, you know, bags are more covert, stealthy, under the radar, very highly profitable, but not as easy to find as shoes. Like shoes are just an easier hustle to do because shoes are everywhere you go uh at the quantity that shoes come into a thrift store i don't think there's enough manpower behind the scenes to accurately catch every single good one right and so i think that's a good uh that's probably the best guide to buy it's also a guide that is about 40 percent larger than any of my other guides so i want to say that memory serves me right there's about 189 slides on that guide or something like that. Something, something kind of absurd. So there's a lot to learn in shoes to bucks. Um, and it's the reason why I have priced it $10 higher, even though it is a 40% more content in that guide than bags to bucks. I'm not saying that any one of my other guides are better than the other. I'm just saying, I think that's the best one if you're a first timer to get into it, because you can find your success much quicker with shoes than it would be with bags. That said, I have found, I don't know why, but the bag hustle is more gratifying for me because I sell shoes and I sell boots. And like yesterday, I moved a pair of shoes for like, what, 120 and I was only like $43 into them or something like that. Um, and it felt good and everything, but it's not as good as for some reason as finding a bag. Like a bag is just like, there's a lot of learning that goes into bags, a little bit more rare, um, not more rare, just less found as easily. And for some reason, it's just, it's just more gratifying. I don't know how to explain it. Um, it just feels better. It's just it's the weirdest thing ever. You can compress them into really, really compact things too, which is kind of cool. But then again, shoes just go in the USPS shoe box, which for the most part is the best way to shoe them, to uh, ship the shoes off. I don't know. Like I, I find more money in shoes, but bags are more gratifying. So it's a really weird kind of thing. Um, when bags do pop though, they typically pop better than shoes or boots when you have a really good one, you know? Um, I have to make a video regarding those. You'll see. Um, okay. I'm trying to get, hey, what's up, everyone? I see everyone in here. Um, 
Matt Jackson said, I sold, I sold a RockShox Judy XL recently for 60 bucks. Yeah, you know, the Judy's not the best fork ever. You know, it's just a normal, just a normal fork. Um, because after the Judy, I want to say back in the day, came the Sid and then the Sid Race. Now, if you find a Sid or a Sid, especially a Sid Race, like a 26 inch version, man, those things still to this day sell for really good money. Um, but a Judy is, was pretty much their entry level fork. <laughs> from back then they even put judy's on like the stump jumpers from like back in the day which there's like no adjustability on the rock shock to judy whatsoever but you know back then it was pretty cool now it's like they're so eclipsed by much better suspension forks and suspension forks these days like even a crappy one on a bike that's about thousand dollars or more a fork is probably going to be 300 dollars of that price already um the fork that i run on my bike is around five almost 550 um and then the forks on bikes that i want to buy that i can't afford yet like a fork for that kind of bike's like 900 to a thousand dollars like that's just the fork that holds the front wheel that's the suspension of the bike it's crazy when you think about it um but like any other hobby whether it be radio controlled or you know bows or freaking firearms or anything like that a hobby has always these crazy extremes for all those people that want to really increase their skills to the next level you know so um yeah there's always something <laughs> a fork for a grand is absurd lol it is but uh, what it, what can it do you know what can a thousand dollar fork do for someone that's the real question because it's absurd to a person that maybe doesn't ride right what it can do is it can assist a person. It makes a bike about a pound and a half lighter. So that's one thing it does. And the other thing that it usually does is it can allow the rider a lot more adjustability in the, in the vicinity of rebound, um, compression, damping, all that kind of stuff. Like all that is super highly adjustable on thousand dollar forks. And then usually what people use thousand dollar forks are, for is flying off ledges and flying off mountains and like, Basically, it saves your life. You know, it can get ahead. Of, it can basically save your life. If you have the right kind of fork on your bike, it can save your life. So a grand as opposed to maybe 30000 in hospital bills, you know, there's some things to be considered. Um, Arturo, 22. I found a waterproof Patagonia bag at the thrift store for 12 bucks. I sold it for 150 There you go. You probably had a black hole one because I don't think that any of the Patagonia bags truly are waterproof unless recently they made some. So maybe you had a water resistant bag and it might have been a black hole more than likely or maybe a rolling black hole but uh i think the rolling black holes might be waterproof but most patagonia bags aren't um and that's like one of the biggest uh drawbacks of patagonia bags even though i own one that's like right here it's what i bring to the coffee shops all the time is that these really well-made black hole bags have portions of the bag i'll just show it to you it's all about learning right so this is the bag that i bought off craigslist for 40 bucks this bag i can comfortably still sell for around 80. um i bought this bag like three years ago this is a black hole 30 wait what is it 30 liter i guess something like that and so this is the nice waterproofing material that they have right here it's a really great bag but here's the thing like everything else is like just nylon like ballistic nylon and ballistic nylon is not waterproof you know especially right here we're all on the top part where actually all the rain is going to hit like if you're traveling around or you know rain comes from top to bottom so you know we have the perimeter of here with we have the perimeter of this bag in that awesome waterproof fabric but the biggest gripe and if you read all the reviews about their black hole series is that they didn't make this part for example waterproof which is like so stupid it's a great bag though i really like it a lot um i didn't want to buy it brand new at the time that was brand new and still to this day it's probably like 120 bucks i don't even think you can buy this one anymore but uh i wanted one real bad and i held out for two months on craigslist found some guy selling one for 70 bucks like mint i offered him 40 we met at a parking lot he sold it to me for 40 bucks i could still sell this thing for around 80 now if i wanted to which is cool so um you know patagonia makes great bags I would never trust that thing with any sort of gear or my laptops in it in a high rain situation. Um, but yeah, when you take when you're dealing with waterproof bags, what you want to look for, and this is not a really highly like uh, the ones that you really want to look for are fish pond, which are actually like for fly fishing. Those are really cool. Um, some Yeti ones now are really awesome. Um, there's some made by Hydro Flask. 
There are certain North Face ones, the duffel bags that are actually waterproof. Um, and some made by, did I say Yeti? Okay. Um, see the Summit makes some as well, but those aren't like the greatest ones. Those are more like just, uh, yeah, they're not that great, but they are waterproof technically. So, um, okay. So Arturo22 says, I think it is. Yeah, if it's part of the Patagonia fly fishing series and everything like that, that's a whole different story. That's really hard to find though. And yes, it's, he says it's perfect for fly boxes, small cameras, or extra clothing. So maybe it is waterproof. Cool. Um, Mountain Hardware does make some pretty good bags, but none of those that I remember are waterproof. Um, what else we got here? Um, any more questions? Let me know. Which antique mall do you have your merchandise in, and what is your booth name? My booth is 199 at the Austin Antique Mall, which is at Burnett and 183, around there. Um, so here's another question from Glock 30 fans. It says, sorry if you covered this, but how do you feel about the shirts that are issued by regional bike events to be worn during the race? Um, I usually don't mess with those. Like I, I'm really, really careful when it comes to bike jerseys. I might find two to four good ones a year now. I, I don't exactly look all the time for them, but if I do, I mean, yesterday I bought two, not jerseys, but I bought two bike shorts. One was a Capo and one was a Castelli, and they were women's. They were two bucks a piece, and I really do think if I lot them both up on eBay that we're looking at around 60 bucks. You know, first class rate, uh, women's bike shorts probably used like one time only. So I bought those from a Salvation Army yesterday. And bike shorts in general have really, I think you're, I think the chances of finding a good mountain biking short that has a padded inside or a race bib. For road biking or biking shorts is higher than finding a, a, a good jersey for example so you should be looking in those kind of like spandexy uh parts of the thrift store so you can find a capo a rafa uh, a castelli a giordana um or a pearl azumi bib you know or a pair of shorts much higher uh chance of finding that than you are to find a winning jersey for example um okay what else we got here um, Lady Luck Junk, just popping in, I have to rewatch. Is there a date for the June Austin meetup? Yes, there is. It's June 26, 27, 28, and 29. That'll be coming up um, two months from now. Um, okay, what else we got here? Hi there. Thanks for the info for a newbie on your guides. I'm brand new to the Hustle Flip game. Any other advice for a first-timer just starting out? I think the number one, <clears throat> the number, number, number one advice that I can give you is to not think that something is valuable just because you heard it on a YouTube video, right? Do your due diligence. Get on eBay. Look at the completed sold items, okay? Not what the existing market has to offer, but what has actually sold in the past 90 days before you make any decision to buy an item that you think is destined for eBay. Do very quick research. Um, and proceed from there. There's nothing worse than a new person that gets into the thrift game and just was like, oh, I heard Tommy Hilfiger mentioned in some video. They buy some random crappy Tommy Hilfiger or poor little Ralph Lauren thing, or even a North Face bag, for example. Like, I heard it, you know, and there's nothing worse than that because then you try to sell it and it sits in your store forever. And you originally thought it was gonna sell for 40 bucks and here, lo and behold, it sells for like 17. And your whole perception of the thrift game is completely warped because of this one experience or maybe a couple experiences like that so you know when i make my videos and everything like that i can't stress that enough to do that due diligence and if you watch my ride-alongs and stuff like that i'm not showing all that kind of stuff because i think it's implied but i can't stress it out enough that when you are new that you got to do those kind of things now it's a different story if you are selling locally for example because now you're bypassing shipping and paypal fees and all that kind of stuff and you can still do you know, you can see what the existing market on a local standpoint looks like for whatever item that you're thinking of selling. Let's say you're at a garage sale, for example, and you're a brand new newbie and you're like, holy crap, an Everlast like boxing bag. Cool. They want $15 for this thing. It's red. It looks like to be somewhere between 60 and 100 pounds. It's big. The three chain, you know, the four chains are on the top. It looks pretty complete. And you're going, hmm, you know, you shouldn't be thinking eBay at that point because it's like a hundred pound bag and it's going to take forever. It's going to take an absurd amount of money to ship it. You should be thinking locally. But if you're a brand new person, you're like, how the hell do I, you know, make this thing come together? This buying decision or this, uh, you know, I see it right in front of my face to a buying decision 
to money in my pocket. Like, how do I get this all completed? So you look at the local markets, you see what a hundred pound bag or a similar bag of that stature is selling for on Facebook marketplace and Craigslist. And lo and behold, maybe there's a bunch of them, you know, from 60 to a hundred dollars. You're looking at one that looks like pretty mint. It's $15. I'd say at that point, get into it, you know, get into it, flip it locally. If it's in really good condition, you can shake out probably in the middle ground, maybe 80 bucks and your first flip now, instead of being a sour crappy first flip, you have a first flip that went from $15 into 80, you made 65, you take that $65, you repeat the exact same thing over and over and over again. You don't detract from that until you have about 100 to 200 really amazing hustles under your belt. At that point, I say experiment, become a scientist detract a little bit and find your way. That's what I think you should do. But yeah, the worst thing you can do is to buy things because you hear them in YouTube videos. Um, and that's the reason why accelerated learning, whether it be mentorships or private Facebook groups or um, guides, for example, like what I have. Um, and we also have private Facebook groups behind the scene too. But there are a bazillion other people out there that involve mentors, uh, that have mentor programs, uh, Rockstar Flipper, uh, for example, Casey did a really good video, uh, I think Saturday or Sunday regarding, um, it, it was a weird title. It was like, this is crazy. It has to stop. But it had to deal with, you know, people that want people that have been in the game for a very long time that are creating paid content and should be rewarded for that paid content. If it's good paid content, it's basically what the video came down to. It was a really brave video. I applaud Casey for putting it up because there are a lot of people out there that think like, oh, free is the whole way to go, like all the time, free, free, free. Guess what? If you do free the whole entire time, it might take you 10 years, okay? 10 years to get the result that you could get in like six months or even one year, all right? You tell me what's more important. It's okay that the person wants to spend 10 years. That's, a, that's fine, but don't try to pollute other people's minds with that as well. Just because you want to wait 10 years doesn't mean everyone else has to wait 10 years. And that's the reason why... You know, Casey's group is behind the scenes. It's there for anyone that decides they want to. Uh, Rally Roots has a mentorship program. We have the green room behind the scenes. I have my four guides available. Um, and no one's twisting your arm to take that leap, you know. But if you decide you want to shorten your learning curve, there are options out there from the top 20% of people that make reselling YouTube videos. There are always options out there. And I think you should definitely consider those options if you want the fast track uh, into the game, really. Of course, you're not going to learn without making mistakes, but I think even with a fast track, you're going to make mistakes. Uh, if you want to wait 10 years and make 10 years of mistake, that's fine too. You know, it's whatever you want to do, but there's always a cost associated to accelerated learning almost every single time. And an efficient market will decide whether it's worth it or not. You know, that's the most important thing is like if the, re if the grand scheme of things that the people think these things are worth it, you know, I pay close attention to like the feedback on my guides. And I'm very proud to say that I'm not, I'm, I'm very proud to say that I'm not afraid to ask, how do you guys feel about my guides? Because I know I put a lot of work into them, but the market decides the outcome and the market are the people that bought the guide. So that's the reason why I never tell you like skewed information because I firmly believe that an efficient market, just like a stock market dictates the price or whether something is actually a premium or not a premium out there. So um, what else we got here? Questions? Yeah, I just want to let people know there are always options to learning more. Always. Um, here we go. Linda Lindquist. Thanks for bags to buck. I just paid off. Just paid it off. Bought a Porta Brace camera duffel bag. Wow, that's pretty awesome. Um, it was more than likely a sound bag. If it's a duffel style bag, that was probably for sound gear. Uh, Eight dollar garage sale find sold on eBay for one hundred twenty five dollars. That's awesome. That's the reason why I was saying earlier, like fifteen minutes ago. That's so rewarding to do a good bag flip for some reason because a little bit, you know, harder to find than a really super shoe flip. But when they flip, it's just like incredible because like, I don't know, it's just a better feeling for some reason. Um, okay, Daniel Zuccarelli. Flipping is a mystery to me. Flipping local is a mystery to me. I've listed so many things on Craigslist have gotten no interest. Live in New Jersey. I wonder if maybe I should list in Philadelphia instead of my New Jersey suburb. What's holding you back? Let me know. Because if it's just, if this place is like an hour away or two hours away, you should be listing at this other place. Um, and that doesn't solve the mystery of having bad items. You might have bad items. You might be trying to flip run of the mill things that just don't flip very well on your local avenues. So that could, that could be a consideration as well. So be careful. Don't just think that it's the local market that, oh, no one wants to, you know, my local market sucks, the items may suck. 
you have to be careful with that. That's another thing that sometimes some newbies get caught in. They're, they're buying items that are just run-of-the-mill items. They're crappy items. Um, you got to buy high marketable items. Very important. High marketable items. If there's no market for it, it doesn't matter. Like they, It can sit on every avenue possible. If there's no market, it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, okay, so let's see here. Ahmed Martin, one dollar super chat. Hey, thanks a lot, man. Um, that'll get me a that'll get me a little bit of a dopio shot here in Austin, Texas. Regardless, I love it. Thank you so much, Ahmed Martin. That makes me feel great. Thank you. Um, let go has gone sour. Should I delete? I've deleted let go. I don't I don't mess with it anymore. Uh, Eagle Empire phones have been by far my fastest, most profitable thing thing to flip. I'm pretty much going full time in that. That's great. If you have a good way to get them, then yeah. Phones are just in such high demand. Like it's so easy to flip a phone. Um, I don't usually get into it because I know you have to do IMEI checks and all this kind of other random stuff, but I don't really get into it. But when I flipped my own phones, it was just like super fast. Like, and you can make more than what your carrier is willing to give you as well, just so you know. Um, here's a little bit of a lesser bag flip from Arturo22. I found an Arctic duffel bag bought for $9.99. Now, Arctic is a competing company with Yeti. It's not even really competing. Like, Yeti is just a better brand. It's probably the same caliber of product, but um, Arctic is just, I'm going to say that Yeti maybe lost some patents or didn't get some patents on some certain things. And so, Arctic and these other co cooler companies, um, Cody and a bunch of others, just started doing roto molded coolers and soft sided coolers. And, um, an Arctic is just a competing brand. I still like Yeti. I like the brand. Uh, that just shows you the power of a brand. I, I align better with Yeti personally. But he said he bought an Arctic duffel bag for $9.99, sold it for $45. Bucks. Pretty cool. Yeah. So he was about to get more for this Arctic thing, but then Arctic ran a spring sale and it just dropped the price on all the duffels. So, yeah, but at least you've flipped it for some profit. So that's pretty good. Um, What's the stuff that has been with the biggest profit on eBay? I guess this is Gabriella CJ's question. Um, when it comes to biggest profits on eBay, it's going to be either the shoe bag or bike thing for me. It really is. Because um, I flipped, I was just thinking about it yesterday. Like when I was going to a Goodwill, I was looking at the bikes outside of the front door, and I was reminded of a $6 bike that I bought at a Goodwill many years ago. Like it was like five years ago, maybe six. Uh, I made it to a video, so it's on the, one of the videos. Um, and that bike sold for like $549 like on eBay. It was a kid's bike. Um, there's just I've been, there's been a lot of good bike flips uh, done on eBay from local markets or local sourcing. Uh, the other question is biggest profit, bag profit. Uh, the biggest one I've had so far on eBay has been $649 sold bag that I bought for like $1.50 or something like that. That was also on one video. Um, I'll probably have to make another one about that one. Uh, best shoe flip on eBay? Probably a $13 pair of boots that sold for like $280, I think. That might be it. I'm not 100% sure. So anyways, let me let me shout out Harry Tornado here. What's up, Harry Tornado? I'll talk to him behind the scenes on Instagram sometimes. For you and E-Money to get some of those fancy coffees, $12 Super Chat. Hey, thanks a lot. That makes me feel good. Thank you so much. You know, today's video that's going to be dropping today, if you guys are good, if you behave yourself, I will drop a, uh, a video today uh, that took a while to edit. It took about two hours to edit. We filmed it last Saturday. It's pretty cool. I think you'll enjoy it a whole lot. Um, let me know. But, yeah, it's basically almost done. Um you know, it takes a while to edit these things. That's the thing. When you see the finished product, uh, whether it be usually a ride along, like those things take a long time to film. They take a long time to edit because there's so much film and you have to like whittle it down to like an acceptable viewing uh, duration. And then uh, um, we've got to filter out all the cuss words. If some music's too loud, we got to get that lowered because you can get copyright infringement. Um, it just, it's not as easy as you think, you know? So, Running an Instagram story every Saturday behind all the vlogging is even harder to do. Uh, we try. You know, I feel like I do marginally. I, I feel like I've taken a really good product and now I'm doing okay on two products as opposed to super good on one. But it's all about reaching uh, as many people as possible. Um, that's the whole goal of Instagram and the YouTube thing is to get as many people 
impossible, you know, to follow the whole thing. And anyway, I look at it, this is, it's a play on, it's a business play for the long haul, you know, so I have to like think about it like that. Um, okay. What other kind of questions we got here? Let me, let me ask you guys a question real quick. How many people are here tuning in? I can't even tell. Let's someone tell me how many people are tuning in. And the question is, all right. The question is which guide has made you the most? Which one did you like the most? Because I know plenty of people here uh, bought more than one, right? And which one do you like the most? So let me think. Let me ask you that that question real quick. Um, that question was asked on Instagram earlier today by a person. He was like, "If I had money to buy one of your guns, which one should I buy?" So you guys answer that real quick. Which one do you like the most? I'm curious. I'm gonna go ahead and say, and not because. It's one of the more expensive guides. I think you'll get, I think you'll get your guide's money quicker back to you and then some and forever because you'll have the income stream. I think you'll have it quicker with shoes to bucks, personally. But that's what I think. Um, okay, so night required feel. Hey, what's up, buddy? Who's gonna end up on the Iron Throne? Looks like you would know. What? I think that's a Game of Thrones like uh I guess that's a reference to Game of Thrones, which I don't watch. That's kind of crazy. Uh, record trader, it seems like your wife is super supportive. Does she ever get irritated with the constant filming? No, she doesn't. She knows that I, if you think it's constant with like the Hustler channel, there's other stuff going behind the scenes as well. I'm uploading three times, around three times a week for my other fitness channel, my workout channel. So you can go check that out at Bod Dam. Um, but yeah, that one's one I'm really working on hard this year. And, uh, it's growing, so that's pretty good. But yeah, does she get ever irritated with the constant filming? No. I mean, sometimes. I don't film all the time. I choose to film the good things or the good parts that support a good storyline, you know? But there's a lot that, that never make it. There's a lot of stuff that never makes it to the vlogs, like ever. But I try to make the vlogs in a certain way so you guys are happy with them and you comment and you like the video so it does better and it brings more people to the channel. If I was to put everything there, then um, it just wouldn't be as exciting, first of all. And second of all, it, the, the video would be way too long and no one would tune in the entire time. I'd have a huge, my drop off rate, it would be like astronomical, which is not good. It's not what I want. Um, but it's the same thing. You kind of want to get the high points, the things that people will talk about, the funny moments. Um, it's kind of like, and I hate to say it, but back in the day, that show, The Newlyweds, which I only watched a couple episodes, but I noticed, I was like, man, this Jessica Simpson person is kind of ditzy, you know? But then I realized in the grand scheme of thing, we're all ditzy, you know? Like every single one of us that's tuning in right now, including myself and my brother, everybody, like we're all ditzy people behind the scenes at certain moments. And if those are the moments that you put in front of the camera and the people see those moments, they start thinking like you're absolutely like ditzy, basically, or like you are this person. And it's just a matter of small snippets of a big picture is what you're seeing, you know, because that's the part that makes the entertainment. Uh, so that's what I try to do is I try to keep those high points and try to get everything right, even though there's a lot more to film. Um, let me res really respond to what people are saying. So Matt Jackson, like bags the bucks, made him some good money. Kristen said shoe guide. Record trader said shoe guide. Canuck girl 16 said bag guide made she liked the bad guy the most, but she made the most off the shoe guide. So that's Canuck Girl 16. By the way, you're hearing all this right now. If you look at the only links down below, you can get any one of the guides for 20% off until Friday. That is it, until this Friday. Uh, if not, the guides are still worth it. I, they're, plenty, they're plenty worth it. But look, it's, we're all hustlers here. We're all resellers. We want the best deal. Like This is a really, really good deal on every single one of my products. There's even a fantastic deal on all four down below. So there should be some links down below. You should go check it out. Um, and grab what you can, you know? Um, yeah, I'll say basically shoe guide first, bag guide later, bike guide after that. No, high ticket item guide maybe after all that. And then the bike guide last because the bike guide takes the most amount of spe spe specialization to make money on. Even though when I look at the past two or three months, like, I've made a good amount of money on bikes, like selling them locally. So it's like I'm, but I'm all I've been with bikes for the past 16 years, so I know them like really quick, you know. Um, but yeah, like I've made probably as much or more through bikes just than a shoe or a bag kind of flip in the past two or three months. So that's just something 
showing you that in the right kind of hands and if you're kind of good at tinkering some things then bikes are really 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 good to get into um we sell bikes every single week it seems like so you know it is what it is we sell shoes every week too um so other people says joe molina says a shoe guide texas pete says a shoe guide uh daniel zuccarelli says i haven't bought one yet but i was leaning back since i feel it's best for ebay sales versus local selling yeah it's not too bad but shoes sell good locally as well if you know what to find i sold some keen newports yesterday i made a 30 dollars profit on those those were sold locally uh they were like ten dollars and i sold them for 40 and that was an easy flip for someone that was going to hawaii like in a couple of days uh saw valuables says shoes uh connect girl says I don't think there's enough opportunity here for bags. That's why she liked the shoe guide better. Um, Evo Empire says, I do need to learn about bags more. I think it's a great thing. Look, any one of my guides is not going to be encompassing. So let me kind of preface that kind of stuff before you make your buying decision. Don't sit there and go, man, I'm going to learn about every single bag known to man in America that's selling. Like, absolutely incorrect. If you're thinking like, I'm going to know everything about every shoe, nah, 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 that's absolutely incorrect. These guides are a direct reflection of what I believe are good profitable items in the shoe category, bag category, high ticket item category of my 16 years of experience. Like that is what it comes down to. I don't find myself very much in the women's shoe section because there's a lot of noise, it's a lot of buzz, you know? It's a lot. It's also the main reason why I don't find myself a lot of times getting all crazy about Nikes and Reeboks and Adidas because there's just a lot of buzz. There's a lot of stuff that you have to dismiss to get to the really, really good stuff. And so I'm not all about fuzz. Like I like certainty as opposed to fuzz. I don't want to spend an hour and a half in a thrift store when, first of all, Austin has so many opportunities with thrift stores. I'd rather go fast. I'd rather go 10 or 15 minutes in each one and see like eight, you know, as opposed to seeing uh, maybe two and three hours. Now I realize I might have a better scenario than some people uh, when it comes to routing in thrift stores, but I certainly don't have the best, right? You kind of take the scenario that you have and you optimize it. That's essentially what you do. But when it comes down to it, I think that, uh, yeah, I just think that it's kind of how you view your personal situation. And the, you, you do the best that you can with your situation. That's basically it. Um, <laughs> all right. What other kind of questions? I'm going to do maybe three more. Big drift thrift says i have an idea for a guide do you mind sharing how you published a guide thank you you know if this is something that needs to be discussed and maybe there's only like five or ten people that are super interested in how to make a guide and how to bring it to market i can tell you how to do it it's really not complicated i'll show you the program i use and exactly the setup and everything um but none of this is easy you know like i spend months making these guides um a lot of pictures and a lot of hard drives to go through to get the pictures uh, because the majority of the guides that I make 90% of the pictures typically that are in the guides are my pictures that have, are things that I have sold you know like so you have to be cognizant of that like I you know I could have made pictures with like 90% were Google images and then 10% were the things that I flipped and the guide could have come out in you know probably three weeks but I don't believe that it's as authentic that way right and I can't really write about things that I'm not super passionate about. And I'm not really passionate about Google images, you know, for example, but I'm passionate about the things that I sold and those images that I snapped because there was an energy there, you know, there was an energy there that made the money that like converted it. And it was like, felt super good. And I want to share it with you guys as well. Cause I think energy is kind of infectious. Like if I have really high energy, you know, you're going to have high energy through the guide too. And that energy is going to translate into more cheddar for the rest of your life, you know, because these guys are not geared to making you, 40 bucks like these guys are geared to making you thousands they really are like if you're a smart person that executes this guide will make thousands over the rest of however many years that these things are relevant which in the past 20 years or something like that like bags have never gone out of style like shoes really not super out of style there's still things that you can buy and resell so i really think that you can take this stuff you know and get a lot of years out of it so Think about those kind of things when you buy these guides. I'm not I'm not trying to have you make like a hundred bucks based upon a bad guide. I want you to make thousands based upon a bad guide. That's the main thing. And for that, I don't think it's unreasonable that someone pays me, you know, 30 bucks or 40 bucks to unlock a thousand, for example. Like that's kind of what's going on through my head. I think anyone willing that's willing to make 
a thousand, even five hundred, or even a hundred. Like, wouldn't you pay twenty or thirty bucks to just make a hundred bucks? Like, okay, so you have to learn some things, but still, like, wouldn't you pay that? Like any normal person, it's kind of like a stock trade. It's pretty simple. You you should do those things. Um, what else we got here? Any more? Um, okay, so the baby stuff that you pick it up that you pick up in your videos is it only specific to the joggers and the baby carriers in the videos? Yeah, those are like the two main things that i like to mess with um because they're easy flips here in austin texas and um yeah i understand those things now when it comes to baby seats and things in the car like i don't quite understand them very well i'm not comfortable showing someone how to put their little baby in those things and like god forbid something happens and they get into some crazy accident and the baby doesn't get you know something happens to the baby like i can't live myself at that point so that's why I mess with jogging strollers and uh, yeah, like additions to the jogging strollers, such as the attachment for like the drinks and everything like that. Those are simple things and no one's gonna be running a jogging stroller at 60 or 70 miles per hour and crashing it. You know what I'm saying? Like usually if an accident happens with a jogging stroller, it's like, oh, you hit a you hit an aisle at a CVS, you know, at a wrong angle. Like I don't think the baby's gonna fly out, you know? Um, but that's, those are the kind of things you have to be thinking about, you know? And that's the reason why I don't mess with some of these other things. Oh, we mess with kid carriers like backpack kid carriers too, because those aren't extremely catastrophic if they if something goes wrong. Because you can spot when something is fraying or shouldn't be brought to market. All these things are made of nylon. They all have very very like overbuilt stitching in them and stuff like that. Uh, I to this day have not found one that is just cracking and gone to pieces or torn or anything like that. So I do baby joggers, and I do pretty much the backpack ones. Those are the two main baby things I do. Um, I have a pair of John, this is from Carol B. I have a pair of John Barbados leather lace-up ankle boots that haven't sold yet, size 11. Does that matter? Size 11 is a great, uh, okay, so size 11 is a really good men's size. John Barbados is a really good uh, boot and shoe maker. Now, if they're lace-up ankle boots, yeah, I heard ankle, which is really good, probably means they have three eyelets on each side or maybe even up to five. Um, my guess why they're not selling is maybe you don't have the model in there, okay? Because John Barbados all have models to them. You're going to have to find out what that model is of that thing. Um, and it's relatively easy to do. You cross-check it with Google Images and stuff like that. You figure out, oh, there's my shoe. That's the image of my shoe. Boom. It's not actually your image, but it's someone else's image. You click on it, and it's from some random like shoe site or maybe even Amazon.com. Uh, based upon that John Barbados shoe, it could even be an eBay listing, honestly. But you, you really want to find that actual model name, whether it be Chelsea or, you know, the New Hampshire boot or something crazy like that. They all have weird names to them. Um, you want to find the model because when someone's looking at John Barbados boots, they're like, oh my God, like I want to have one like my friend and he has the X model, you know, or I want to have a secondary pair of the ones that are about to break. And the ones I have are the New Hampshire model, for example. So they're going to look up New Hampshire models, just like when you have a pair, favorite pair of running shoes and let's say that they're Nimbus 13s or something like that. You're going to look down, see Nimbus 13, boom. You're going to go into eBay, put Nimbus 13, and you're going to try to get the same pair if they're like the perfect pair of running shoes. So you have to be thinking about lines like that. When you're dealing with shoes, you want to put the brand, you want to put the color variant, you want to put the gender, you want to put the size, you want to put the, the make of whatever it's made, by, uh, made with, like nylon, it could be suede, it could be... Um, it could be leather. You want to put a general style too, because it could be broke. It could be wingtip. Um, you know those kind of things. Um, and then any other kind of descriptive kind of things. You know, like you could have logger boots. You could have motorcycle safety, steel toe. Like there's all kinds of different ways to describe it to bring that perspective buyer to look at that listing and make a decision whether they want it or not. So without those things, it's hard. <laughs> it's much harder for a buyer to land on your listing, but the buyers are out there on eBay. That's for sure. Okay. So I'm about to be out of here in like one second. Uh, do I buy shape ups, uh, which are sketchers? I don't, I have flipped them before. They're just not like my favorite thing to ever mess with. Those are MBTs. Like I just don't look at them that much. Uh, usually here in this town, they're about 20 bucks and usually shape ups go from 40 to 50, 60. I'm just not really into those, but I have flipped them before. Uh, I think a better flip to look for, that's almost a guaranteed as good as shape up profits are better or usually better are Z coils, honestly. So uh, go check it out. Z coils are the really good ones. Um, what else we got here? Um, 
Can I tease with my next guide idea? Um, I haven't really thought about making another guide. Honestly, the next thing I'm working on is actually fitness related and it's gonna be behind the scenes and yeah. So if I do another guide, I've thought about it. I was like, it could be high ticket items to bucks number two because there's more stuff to discuss that I had, you know, just didn't make it to the first guide. Um, I thought about jackets to bucks as well because I'm gonna sell a fair amount of jackets, but that's a little bit more dependent on seasonality still good though um we'll see it just really depends usually when i have an idea of a guide it's just like boom like i'm gonna make the guide like that's just it high ticket items to gut bucks wasn't spontaneous but you know after about a week of thinking it i decided like i'm gonna execute this and then nine or ten weeks later it was done i mean it took a while thought about toys to bucks or rc items to bucks you know those all make really good money if you know what to do um what made you start reselling that's a great question from ricardo gurola um it was a hoffman bike that was found at a goodwill in fact i write about it in my first book that's on amazon in fact i will tell you um hustler beginnings it's actually this is such a crudely made book look at this thing so it's called hustler beginnings right there it says chapter one and i was at a goodwill and here we go. As I scanned the bikes, I noticed one that was called Hoffman. Something truly really triggers in my mind. I have seen this somewhere. It didn't take long for me to realize to place this brand with the kinds of bikes that are ridden in sports games within the X Games at local skate parks around the USA. <clears throat> this was a quality brand. I knew that much. So I glance at the top tube of the bike. I see a price, $7.99. I look at the condition, determine it needs two tubes. I start thinking to myself, that's going to cost about 10 bucks. So fast forward down here, blah, 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 blah. <clears throat> to make a long story short, I buy the bike, perform the duties needed, and I sell the next day for $80 locally. So there it is. <laughs> and the funny thing I say here, I kept that paragraph off. Now let's fast forward to that to the present day. After hustling thousands of bikes, other items, and making tons of cash, and building a YouTube channel, I suppose that you could say I took it to the next level. Um, that's all in the guide. That this thing was written like five years ago, and I have done in the in the end of this guide. I talk about this thing called FBA and how I might jump into it. Like that's in here. It's kind of funny, but that's five years ago. Snapshot. Um, so what else we got here? Just about the shoe guide. Okay, so I'm about to get out of here. I, my phone's blowing up. I think someone's gonna pick up something locally from me here in a second. I'm almost positive. Four thirty. Yeah. So I have to. I, 45 minutes, I have to sell something locally. I got to get off here because this, this show went a little too long. Hopefully, I answered you guys some questions regarding shoes, bikes, high ticket items, um, or even bags. The discounts to these guides, if you've hung around for this long, which if you have, I'm surprised because long videos usually don't do good in YouTube whatsoever. Check out down below. The actual discounts to the guides are all there. It's going to end on Friday, and uh, this might, it's not going to be the last show I do because I'm going to try to do shows every single day until the sale is over. Um, but I really appreciate all your questions and all that kind of stuff. Hopefully I can, you know, respond with some good uh, answers and clarify some things for you guys. Uh, if you had to figure out like, which is the one out of the four that you should go with first, I personally think it's the shoe guide first. Um, and then it's a tie between the bags and the high ticket items guide because both can make some really good money. High ticket items is very diverse. There's actually shoes in there, bags in there. There's all kinds of crazy things in there. Um, and that has 50 items that are, I consider high ticket items are pretty fun. Um, hard to say, but if you're going to pick up just one, just one, like get the shoe guide while it's on discount and then, uh, read through it quick. Like try to take a day or two, read through it quick because all the other guides are just about that same kind of setup mentality. Like, you know, if you enjoyed it, you're like, holy crap. Like I want to learn more about bags now jump onto the bag deal, get it while it's, you know, on sale. Uh, but it might take you a while to go through 189 slides of the, uh, the shoe guide. It is not it's a lot it's a lot and most people are like kind of fries their head i was asking for feedback on that guide and almost unanimously like people are like I, I can't consume this in like one day this is much harder than i thought you know and yeah it's good that it fries your head because it's always going to be there it's always going to be making you money and you can always go back to it and reference things but um that's the biggest one out of all the guides so just so you know that's pretty much it guys i'm i'm really happy to have done this video and uh i'll try to upload another video today regarding yes no two days ago, three days ago, when we went to uh, garage sales. You're going to love this video coming up on my channel soon. It should drop today. Take it easy, guys. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.